Today we're wrapping up our series called Seeking God. This series has been about finding your heart's true home. Back in Campbellford, I met and became friends with Joe from Joe's Vacuum Shop. He was the son of a couple from our church, and he was a former pastor. One of the things that Joe used to do was use his shop as an outreach center. He had quite a ministry reaching out to the forgotten in the community. And every Saturday, he would close the shop in the afternoon, and people would start arriving for a time of singing, prayer, and teaching. We had a little motto. If you feel like you're uh, like you have a vacuum in your life, come and have God fill it. Today, Joe is back in ministry. He is the pastor at Through the Roof in Flinton, Ontario. Over the years, both he and I have witnessed God fill the empty places in people's lives many, many times. I learned that our motto was not original to us. Back in the 1600s, there was a French Christian philosopher by the name of um, Blaise Pascal. He talked a lot about uh, an emptiness that many people have in their heart and their lives and, and how we look to fill it with things that cannot help instead of allowing God to fill it. Because he is the only one that can do it. Today, people have summarized this teaching with the phrase, in every person's heart, there is a God-shaped vacuum. What Pascal was saying then was that we all have a void, an emptiness, an infinite abyss that can be satisfied only through a personal relationship with God. This is still true today. Our hearts are restless. There is an emptiness inside of us that only God can fill. This is also similar to what the theologian St. Saint Augustine said many centuries ago. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. This is our true home, and this is where we belong, in a personal relationship with God, whom we encounter through his Son, Jesus Christ. So the best thing you can do for yourself and for the world around you is to devote your time, energy, and effort towards seeking God. It is by far the best way to live. Now, in week one of our series, we talked about seeking God's face, which is about seeking his presence. This means that day in and day out, all throughout the day, you turn your eyes towards him again and again, acknowledging his presence in your life. Last week, we talked about seeking God's hand, which is to seek his power, his protection, and his provision. Seeking God is not just about standing on a mountaintop and, and uh, staring up into the sky. It involves breaking up the fallow ground of your life and surrendering every aspect of who you are to his lordship. As we saw last week, this involves repentance and obedience and persistence. By the way, if you missed any of the messages in this series, you can go on to the church website and you can listen to them there or watch them actually. So we've talked about seeking the face of God. We've talked about seeking the hand of God. And today we'll talk about seeking the heart of God. Seeking the heart of God means to live according to his priorities. In other words, that which matters most to God becomes that which matters most to you. As we do this, as we live according to his priorities, we are drawn into a deeper relationship with him. Over the centuries, there have been many people who felt that the best way to serve God was to isolate themselves from the world and engage in and endure uh, through some extreme practices that they felt would give them favor with God. And, you know, Martin Luther was a, a monk who was trying to earn his salvation, uh, as what I've read, by climbing the cathedral steps on his knees and saying prayers with each painful step. He believed that he had to endure suffering in order to please God. But God got his attention, and he said, you can't earn your salvation by doing this. It's a free gift. It's yours for the asking. It is received only by faith through grace. 
Thus, the Protestant Reformation began, which was a movement that helped get us back to where we needed to be, immersed in God's word, not in the traditions of man. Here's another example that goes <clears throat> all the way back to the 4th century. And if history tells us anything, it tells us we have a tendency to take our eyes off of God and look to ourselves to fill the vacuum in our lives, and it happens regularly. St. John uh, Chrysostom, who lived in the late 4th century, became known primarily as a great preacher. In fact, his name loosely translated means the one with a golden voice. It was given to him uh, to signify his eloquence in the pulpit. But he was more than a great preacher, he was a great pastor. He was a powerful and influential leader in the early church. However, in the <coughs> early days of his Christian life, he followed what had become a fad in Christian circles in the early centuries. Back then, if you wanted to be really, really, really spiritual, you went to the desert and you became a hermit, devoted your life to ceaseless prayer and Bible study. You denied yourself not only every luxury, but even the most basic comfort, such as eating a normal meal or sitting down to relax or even lying down to sleep. He spent two years in the desert on his feet, even sleeping while standing up. The result of living under these extreme conditions was that he permanently damaged his stomach and his kidneys, and he was plagued by health problems for the rest of his life. He did come to his senses, realizing that this was not what God wanted, and after two years in the desert, he returned to Antioch to pursue ministry and to be ordained in the church. It was then that God used him and this is why he is remembered today as a great pastor and preacher. What made John so special? Within a few years after his return to Antioch, he began preaching at the local church, but his sermons were different than what the listeners had come to expect. Instead of delivering theological dissertations filled with allegory and symbolism, he preached the plain and practical application of the simple truths of Scripture. Instead of challenging people to run off to live a hermit's life in the desert, he challenged them to stay right where they were and to love one another. Instead of focusing on building great cathedrals, he built a network of hospitals to care for the sick and the poor. Here's an excerpt from one of his sermons. Do you wish to honor the body of Christ? Then do not ignore him while he is naked. Do not pay him homage in the temple clad in silk, only to neglect him outside where he is cold and ill-clad. He who said, This is my body, is the same who said, You saw me hungry and you gave me no food. And it is he who said, Whatever you did to the least of my brothers, you did also to me. What good is it if the Eucharist table is overloaded with golden chalices when your brother is dying of hunger? Start by satisfying his hunger, and then, with what is left, you may adorn the altar as well. In the story of uh, Christostom, we see the transformation of a man concerned first with mere religious rituals and regulations to a man whose life and ministry became all about pursuing the heart of God and putting God's priorities into practice. Seeking God's presence in the quiet solitude of your prayer closet is a wonderful thing and it should be part of your daily spiritual journey. Worshiping God in the beauty of his sanctuary is a wonderful thing and it too, should be a key part of your spiritual journey. But there's a deeper level to seeking God which we all must be willing to pursue, and that is seeking God's heart. Devote your life to doing that which matters most to Him. Seeking God means that we say, God, I need your presence in my life, I need your power, your protection, and your provision, and I want to live my life according to your priorities because that which matters most to you matters most to me. And so the question then becomes, what matters most to God? What touches his heart? What pleases him? 
Is it that we run away to a life of solitude, denying ourselves the basic necessities of life, sleeping, standing up, and ignoring those around us? Or is it something else? Well, it's something else. So today I want to talk about three things that matter to God. Three things that we need to put at the top of our priority list because these items are at the top of His priority list. His list isn't exhaustive, but or this list, I mean, isn't exhaustive, but it's a good foundation and it's a good start. First of all, if you want to seek God's heart, you will love as he loves. When Jesus was asked, which is the greatest of the commandments, his answer was straight and simple and to the point. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, Luke 10, 27. The Christian life, before it is about anything else, is about love. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, John 13, 35. And Paul said, the greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 13. Love must be the driving force behind all we do. We worship God. Why? Because he is worthy? Absolutely. <clears throat> because we are commanded to? Absolutely. Both good reasons. But to go one step higher on the scale is to worship him because your heart is bursting with love for him. It's not about obligation. It's about celebration. And please understand, I'm not talking about um, momentary emotion. I'm talking about lifelong connection. We celebrate our love for him through worship, through a spirit of gratitude, and through recognizing that he is the giver behind every good gift. It's one thing to step outside in the morning and say, my, what a beautiful day. It's quite another to step outside and say, what a beautiful day that God has created for everyone to enjoy. It's more than just a difference in how you phrase it. It's having a view of the world that is fueled by your love for him. This attitude pleases him. He not only wants us to love him, he also wants us to love others. Bill Hybel said, uh, you've never made eye contact with a person who does not matter to God. In the same way that God loves those who go to church each Sunday to sing his praises, he loves those who wake up Sunday morning to hungovers uh, or to hungover to get out of bed. In the same way that he loves those who contemplate him day and night, he loves those who never give him a second thought. In the same way that God loves you, he loves that person next to you, that person who gets on your nerves, that person whose faults are so much more visible than your own, that person who looks different or talks different or thinks differently than you. And by the way, as an aside, God's dream for that person who uh, does not know him is not that someday they will become like you or me. His goal is that someday they will become like his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the same journey that we're on as well. Here's what I'm saying. Just as God wants your life to be all about your love for him, he wants your life to be all about your love for others. Even to the radical extent of loving your enemies, even to the radical extent of loving those whom society might call the least of these. Loving your enemies doesn't mean that you surrender to your enemies or that you abandon all of your personal boundaries. But it does mean that when you have the chance to do good for someone who doesn't wish you well or for someone who refuses to be your friend, you do it. Seeking the heart of God means that you live with the attitude that says, I want to make my life all about love, loving God above all else and loving others as I love myself. This attitude leads us straight to the next priority that I want us to consider. Seeking the heart of God means that you will make your life all about serving others. It's not enough to say, of course I love people. Words can't describe the feelings I have in my heart for all people. I love everybody, especially when they stay out of my way. 
This attitude isn't God's attitude. Jesus said, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Mark 10, verses 43 and 44. We know that this is a key priority for God, that you devote your life to serving others, because that's what Jesus did. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. Our lives are to be all about service. That's why Peter tells us each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, 1 Peter 4.10. He's saying that whatever God has given you in terms of resources, talent, skills, and opportunities, you are to use them not for yourself, but for the betterment of others. I mean, can you imagine how the workplace could be revolutionized if everyone's attitude towards the customers and co-workers was, what can I do for you? Can you imagine how marriages and families could suddenly turn right side up if someone stepped up and said, my role in this family is to serve, so what can I do for you? Can you imagine the impact a church could have on its community if their attitude became, we're here for you, what can we do for you? Jesus said, in effect, just as I came to serve others, I'm calling you to do the same. And it's also why he said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me, Matthew 25, uh, verse uh, 40. Seeking the heart of God means that we care most about what he cares most about, and he cares about serving others. Now, there's one more priority that I want us to take a look at. God wants us to love, God wants us to serve, and he wants us to obey. Seeking the heart of God means that you will get serious about a life of holiness. When God chose David to be king, he said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do, Acts 13, 22. The New American Standard Bible says, Who will do all my will? Do you see the connection? A man or a woman seeking after God's own heart will, uh, will do all his will, all that God asked them to do. His goal for you, believe it or not, is nothing short of perfection, and that you become just like his son, Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 29. Our total and permanent transformation won't take place until we've reached heaven. Until that day, he wants us to engage ourselves in the process of becoming more like him every day of our lives. In other words, he wants you to be serious about obedience, and he wants you to be serious about holiness, and he wants you to be serious about doing all of his will. God's priority for you is that you become holy, and as far as you're concerned, your holiness matters more than anyone else's. As far as you're concerned, after the resurrection, Jesus spent some time alone with Peter, restoring him back into leadership and challenging him to move forward into the future, warning him that he would face some tough times in the days to come. See, Peter looked over at the Apostle John and he asked him then, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me, John 21, 22. In other words, Jesus was saying, John has his own story and his own journey, but that has nothing to do with your relationship to me. In this context, what matters most is the person that you're willing to become. There are many who want to make their lives and their ministries all about the holiness of others, or to be more specific, the lack of holiness in others. They claim to be speaking for God, but all they do is point their fingers at everyone else. I want you to know that as far as you're concerned, God is most concerned with the person you're becoming in your own journey into holiness. God's priority for you is not that you become the world's critic, but that you become the world's example of what he of what he has the power to accomplish in the life of someone who seeks him above all else. Seeking the heart of God means that you strive to build your life on his priorities. 
and the foundational priorities of God are that you love him and that you love others and that you serve him by serving others and that every day you move in the direction of holiness in the direction of obedience and in the direction of doing all his will. Seeking God is about more than just standing on a mountaintop overwhelmed by emotion as you gaze into the heavenly skies. To be clear, these mountaintop experiences are wonderful and they're transformational. And I encourage you to go to the mountaintop as often as you can. But that's not all there is to seeking God. Seeking the fullness of God in your life means that you come out of the prayer room and out of the sanctuary and into the streets where the people are seeking the fullness of God um, means, where people seeking the fullness of God means that you um, exit the desert and you go back to the streets so that you can start serving others in the name of Jesus Christ. Seeking the heart of God means that you determine to build your life on his priorities. So that what matters most to him becomes what matters most to you. What matters most to him? He wants you to love him and love others. He wants you to serve him by serving others. And he wants you to walk with him on the path to holiness, eager to do all his will. In doing this, you're saying, God, doing that which matters most to you matters most to me. On this, I will build my life. And in response, God will say, here is a man or here is a woman after my own heart. Let us pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this reminder um, of what it means to seek you with all of our heart. And Lord, we acknowledge that we need your help in this journey. That we maybe need a shift in our thinking that we need to remember your priority is to love those that we encounter, those that we rub shoulders with. It's to involve an attitude that says, I'm here to serve you. What can I do to serve you? And Lord, it involves holiness. It involves obedience. And Lord, we need your help in all of these areas in our life. So I pray that you would lead us, you would guide us, you would direct us, and help us to be your best representatives to the world around us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.